Hello, my name is Thomas. Welcome to British Culture Albion Never Dies. This week I interview the author Mark Edlitz, who wrote, among other things, the book The Many Lies of James Bond. We talk about 007, we talk about James Bond Jr. There may be a trip for memory lane for many listeners. We did actually talk about it before recording began, but we do circle back to it, along with touching on a variety of other film, television and radio topics. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Okay, we're now recording. Mark, thank you very, very much for joining me today. Uh, Would you like to give the listeners a quick thumbnail sketch of who you are? Yes, I would. Uh, My name is Mark Edlitz, and I'm an author. I've written a few books. Uh, The first one is called How to Be a Superhero, which was interviews with actors who have played superheroes for the last six or seven decades. I wrote a book called The Many Lives of James Bond, which was interviews with a bunch of actors who have played James Bond in different media besides film. You know, there's radio, there's video games, there's an animated series, uh, as well as audiobooks. My third book was called The Lost Adventures of James Bond, which we'll be talking about. So I'll spare you for that for a second. And my fourth book was called Movies Go Forth, Fourth Films in Fantastic Franchises. And that's about, as the title suggests, big popular fourth films like Jaws 4, Superman 4, Batman 4, Batman and Robin, etc. And and The Phantom Menace. Well, that's the big question with with Star Wars is what do you consider to be the fourth film? Mm. Is it episode four, which actually came out first? Is it episode one, The Phantom Menace, which I think is most people's answer is what is the fourth Star Wars film? Or I offer uh, that it was a made-for-TV Ewok film that came out immediately after Jedi. It was a TV movie, but it was released theatrically overseas. Mm. So if you were in certain countries, you your fourth Star Wars film in the movie theater was this Ewok film. Yes, and that's now available on Disney Plus, right? So it's now and, 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 and uh, for, for many years, it was not available. Uh, you know, you could only get it sort of under the radar at conventions or mm-hmm. whatever. But now, happily, it's available. So we've had to hold on very tightly to our old VHS copies. Um, <laughs> yes. Long into the DVD era, it was the only way to get it. <laughs> That's really, really interesting. Can I ask, what's drawn you to write about these films or film in general? Well, I, I I'm going to give you an answer, and I and I think and I hope it's the truth, but it might not be. I think I backed up into this topic because the Batman and Robin, the, four, the fourth Batman film, Superman for the quest for peace and Jaws for, or Jaws for the revenge uh, is sort of the, 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 they're not the most, most creatively successful of those films in the franchises. They're, they're always the ones that get kicked uh, to the curb. If you if you ever see a, blog you know the worst sequels in movie history those four films often come come on it and i think i said oh that's sort of interesting it's those are all four what what can i extrapolate from that Mm. so i interviewed filmmakers from you know a lot of popular fourth films uh uh rambo four uh die hard four uh you know, on and on, you know, your big, you know, all the ones that you would think Hi- Highlander, horror films, Jaws, Freddy, Is Indiana Jones, if we're not including the TV Even show. James Bond, uh, James Bond has a fourth, yeah. obviously, Thunderball. The fourth, as you're saying, uh, Indiana Jones isn't necessarily well received either. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, but some of them, you know, when you look at Mad Max 4 or, or uh, Fury Road, that's considered a high watermark. So I wanted to speak to filmmakers and find out what happened. And some films I didn't even know became fourth films. Like there's a a, a comedy series called Meatballs. Okay. The, 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 the original was with Bill Murray and it was very popular. But did you know that there was a, a, a second Meatballs and a third? I did not. And there was even a, a fourth Meatballs. And I had no idea until I started working on this book. And what's interesting about the fourth Meatballs 
is that didn't start out as, as a Meatballs movie. It started out as an indie film called Happy Campers, starring Corey Feldman. And halfway through shooting, after the movie started, the producer came on the set, took the director aside and said, well, this is now Meatballs 4. Wow. <laughs> right? Yes. That doesn't happen all that often. No. So it, it, it's filled with stories like that from the filmmakers talking about their experience. That's the reality of filmmaking, the, uh, the lived experience as opposed to, you know, some of us might watch a film and say, oh, why didn't they do this or that? But they had to contend with the reality of. Exactly. And why did these films get made? What? How do you even come up with a hook for your fourth film? Because trilogies used to be the... Mm perfect form of storytelling and used to be the sign of a film's success and becoming part of a franchise because a trilogy is a beginning, middle and end. Yes. You know, you see that with Star the first three Star Wars films, the beginning, middle and end. So what do you do when the story is, is actually over Mm. now? What? Oh, that's really interesting. And of course, Bond is the kind of the combo breaker there. We don't really have a beginning, middle and end for Dr. No from Russia with love and Goldfinger. Yeah, well, and that's interesting because there's certain professions that lend themselves more to to additional films. If you're a spy, if you're a detective, you could always get assigned another mission. There's always another murder. Mm. There's something outside the hero to generate the story. But like, if you look at Die Hard, uh, he is a cop. You know, mm. John McClane is a detective, but that movie is not about his being a cop. It's about him being in the wrong situation. So then what do you do for the second one? You put him in another wrong situation. And how many times can this guy be in the wrong situation before it's just absurd? Yeah. Yeah. We get to the the taken question of how many family members of Liam Neeson are going to be kidnapped. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Yeah. And then with Jaws, it's how Jaws the Revenge, how is... A, a shark getting revenge on a dead shark's family member yes. victims. What what does one shark have to do with another shark? I guess he was mad at that family for hurting his other shark buddy. Yes. I don't know. I'm afraid the only thing I know about it is the Michael Caine quote, which I'm sure yes, I'm yes. sure gets quoted at you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good one. It's a good one. And it also suggests that there's other reasons uh, for making sequels other than, you know, the artistic well, yes. merits of the film or the story. Yes. And, and we have a fair few Police Academy movies, right? Or Carry On movies in the UK, if you want the equivalent. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there might be ten Police Academy and a cartoon series. Mm. Uh, you know what I what I spoke to the uh, I interviewed the writers and directors for that, and I thought instead of making additional Police Academy movies, they should have taken that cast and put them in different situations because the first Police Academy I think would have been better remembered if it if if it weren't for these sequels. Yeah, you know. And then it always becomes when do this when do the series come to to space, you know when it's it, it, that's usually the the bad sign. Although I, I do love James Bond in space in, in Moonraker. Oh, absolutely yes, I feel that's one that works. I'm interested. You refer to animations uh, for Police Academy because we mentioned earlier about the uh, James Bond Junior uh, that attempt to make Bond on the small screen. Right. So let's talk about James Bond Junior. So I cover this in in, in the book uh, The Lost Adventures of James Bond. And as your listeners will, will will might remember, there's a animated series called James Bond Jr., which came out, I think, in 1991, and there were 65 episodes. And it wasn't just these 65 episodes, but there were a comic mm-hmm. book series by Marvel. There were spinoff books. There were that were that were aimed at. There were even spinoff books aimed at you know young readers, yeah. you know, like little flip books that were like. I don't know, 14 pages long. You know, maybe they were 12, maybe they're 15, I don't remember. But, you know, they, they're yeah. really geared at, at, at for youngsters. And there were also a, a great series of action figures and vehicles. So full disclosure, I remember reading the comics. I think I watched the TV show sometimes. I do remember the figures and toys. So it was kind of a, kind of a big deal at the time. It was a very big deal, but it was also a little bit strange because... I don't think we, the public, understood, or at least I didn't, how 
this uh, James Bond is an adult is aimed at adult. The movies are aimed at adults. Yeah. The 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 Fleming novels are for adults. Mm-hmm. These it's not kids' fair. You know, you might read it when you're in high school, as I did, but they're they're not for kids. And this cartoon was definitely aged down, but that was not their original intention. Oh, a, a better model for this might be. I don't know if you're familiar with Batman the Animated mm. Series. Yes, it came out so, a little after. Is that right? Yes, it did. And the Batman animated series was more adult oriented. It took a kid's figure and it did appeal to kids, but it was all, there was also plenty in it for more sophisticated audiences and for adults. Mm -hmm. And they even tried it on, they tried taking an episode and putting it on prime time just because it was so well received. Mm -hmm. And it showed that you can do a comic, you could do a cartoon for adults as as we all know, it doesn't always have to be, you know, quote unquote kids fair. It's and, become more mainstream it, now, right? And uh, yes, I yes. lean into the Star Wars background again. So with the Clone Wars, <laughs> it starts out pretty kiddie and then gets more and more by Series 7. I'm not sure if some of that should be shown to kids. <laughs> right. And and it speaks to the original intentions. You know, if you read this the series Bible, which, which I quote from in the book, they were trying to make James Bond movie style adventures in this animated form mm. and they wanted to, you, it's different you'll you'll see that they had ideas of opening it you know they wanted to use the james bond theme which is not used in in the cartoon and that's probably for financial reasons it's expensive to use it's quite a peppy theme uh, and they tune, wanted to, oh, peppy might, sorry, quite a peppy theme tune uh if I, to, <laughs> if I was to use a word peppy might be it <laughs> and they wanted to open up with the you know the, the gun barrel you know they wanted it to make to make it look like a James Bond movie, but then I think you come across the problem of these things are really need to be made on a budget, and you're cranking out sixty five episodes. There are limits to what you could do, despite your ambitions. Yeah, that seems a very large number to me to start with a new series of say just sixty five. Right. Uh, it 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 does and it is, but it was also the. The, the, almost the standard because you you order 65 episodes you play them five days a week and that's your season that's the way the the the, the television series at least in america was built okay so it was more like plugging it in to that model and you know there's often been talk of spin-offs around this time a possible way lynn film a possible jinx film all kinds of spin-offs and we did have books like the Eve Money Penny Diaries. Sorry, the Jane Money Penny Diaries. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Oh yeah. I mean, there's a great there's a great trilogy of books called the the Money Penny Diaries that uh, I'm actually writing about in in my next book. Oh. Um, but uh, they're really they're really wonderful, and they are they were they were perceived by the public, including me, as sort of being romance novels hmm. about. Money penny, but that's the, the the furthest thing from the truth. They're actually legitimate spy and espionage tales that take place within Fleming's timeline. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So a bit yeah. closer to perhaps the King Sherwood books now, in terms of not focused on Bond, but the world around him. Right, right. Well, well you know what? Uh, yes and no. He does appear more than, than I would have thought in the Money Penny Diaries. I would have assumed that he would be, you know, this figure that Money Penny would only see, you know, walking down the hallways <laughs> or at the photocopy machine or whatever, you know, just yeah. a passing figure. But he he is he is part of the narrative. Mm, okay. Okay. How would you compare the success of James Bond Jr., the Money Penny Diaries, this kind of thing, compared to other franchises? Well, you know, I mean, I think that's the thing that even as, as where we are now with James Bond people want more James Bond mm. stories. Some might say James Bond content, yeah, which is, which is an ugly term, uh, but people want more James Bond. Mm. And what do you, how can you deliver more James Bond if it's primarily a movie going experience in terms of dramatic storytelling? Well, that's, what I sort of discovered while writing the book, The Lost Adventures, is that the James Bond series is much bigger than you think. It's not limited to the movies. Mm. Obviously there's the novels, 
but there are comic books, there are comic strips, there are video games, there's audio books. There's, you mentioned um, earlier some radio plays, so not just oh radio like, dramas. Oh, and they're excellent. There's, there's excellent BBC Four yeah. radio dramas with, with Toby Stevens as James Bond, and what's great about those is that they are adaptations of the mm. novel. You know, they're they're not the film versions of those stories. They adapted they adapted the novel and they did the novels and they did a really good job. Oh yes, and these are full cast productions and uh, set in the fifties, pretty much. Yes, with Toby Stevens as James Bond, who obviously played a villain in um, Die Another Day, and he, he's quite good as Bond. Oh yeah, I, I really like him as as Bond, and he's a good one. And of course, we now have the Road to a Million reality show. Right, which is kind of James Bond themed. Right. Well, that that's where you get where what else can you do to provide James Bond experiences to the public between movies? And that's why if you want more Bond, there's all this other Bond out there. You just and it's not that hard to find it. Mm. It somehow makes me think of the uh, Star Wars Shadows of the Empire project, where there was a book, a comic, a video game, a CD of music, everything except a movie. Um, right. I mean, that was a great uh, sort of a, a experimental idea. Can you do all that? Can you can you do all the uh, merchandise and 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 products around it without actually having a movie? Mm. And I. I it seemed like it was successful, at least from, you know, it's well, it's well remembered. It is definitely well remembered. A lot of people feel it opened the gates for, say, the Star Wars Special Editions and then for the prequels carrying on. So a lot of people put the resurgence of Star Wars somewhere around there. That's interesting. Where do you, where do you see the Bond franchise kind of going uh, in terms of all these spin-offs? Do you think they could do a new James Bond Jr., for example? Now animation is a, a bit further ahead of where it was then. I think they could. I don't think they will. I mean, you were talking about 65 episodes is a lot, and I was saying it's five days a week. You know, mm. you do, you don't need to do that model anymore. You could, you, one could do weekly, or one could uh, just have, we're going to make six to eight to 10 to 12 episodes. Uh, maybe they're self contained. Maybe, you know, each, there's, each one is a different mission. Maybe there's, Maybe they connect, but you can, you could do it much at a much higher level than they attempted to in 91. But there's no suggestion that that's something that they're exploring now. Fair enough. Fair enough. We're just uh, blue sky thinking. (laughs) (laughs) I'm wondering if you could have any James Bond project, what would you, what would you like if Eon said, make anything you want? I'm always wrong about these things. That's the thing. Like when when Daniel Craig was announced as James Bond, you know, I went back and I rewatched Lair Cake and I thought, good actor, but he's not James Bond. Mm. Uh, and I was really wrong. And part of the reason why I was wrong is because they weren't trying to tell, you know, they weren't trying to make another Pierce Brosnan style Bond. They weren't trying to make another Roger Moore style Bond. They were trying to do something new. And so when it's fun to it's fun to sit around and and and, and speculate, but what makes it so hard is because you're applying an old model to something that they're trying to do new. Mm. So when so they say, oh, so and so should be bond, it's like, well, when? Is the new Bond going to be, you know, in his 20s, starting out? Is it going to be another origin story? I, I doubt it. Is he going to be an older Bond? You know, the, what kind of story are they telling? Will, 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 and what's, you know, what is their script? That will dictate the the actor who's going to play them. Play yeah, fair enough. I think in the early 2000s, trying to get someone to out Brosnan, Pierce Brosnan, would have been a <laughs> poison chalice. <laughs> So, yeah, so people do talk a lot about who is the next Bond. We don't have any idea of screenwriters or directors or, or anything at all yet, where they want to go. Cycling back, you, you're writing a book on fourth films. How do you feel Thunderball then falls into that kind well, of well, discussion? Well, I, I, I asked, um, I, I, I interviewed one of the actors uh, for that, and uh, she, she, she played the villain. And I said, well, what was it like to work on the set of the fourth James Bond film? And she said it was 
so relaxed. Like you could feel that the, you could, they were so comfortable with, and they were, you know, they worked hard and they were focused, but there was a confidence in what they were doing, knowing that there was a huge demand for, for Thunderball. And obviously they were right. And it just permeated every aspect of the production. So they're not sitting there wondering, is anyone going to watch my movie? They, they knew it. They knew all, they knew if they if they worked hard and you know put were creatively focused that they didn't have to take that extra bit of worry. They mm. knew that there was a d- demand. And that's very different from you know the when gold when they were making Goldeneye, uh not the not, not Eon. Eon knew, but MGM and everyone else was wondering: Is James Bond still relevant? Mm. You no, know, will James Bond work? You know, is he past his sell by date? And obviously, with Goldeneye, they proved that he still does work, and there's still tremendous demand. And you know, right now we're in a period where our, you know, the the most beloved franchises are all dinged a little bit in terms of I'm not talking about quality. I'm talking about, uh, you know, how they do financially, Mm -hmm. uh, which is different than, which can be different than quality, but, you know, star Wars is dinged a little bit. Uh, you know, even the flash with Batman didn't connect the, the fifth Indiana Jones, you know, mission impossible. There's no, what we would once call sure things, mm. Star Wars and, and Marvel's not doing great. DC's not doing great. Uh, what 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 were once sure things are now not. So there has to be some thought in how are they going to tackle the next, you know, cycle of James Bond films, which will take you know ten to 12, 14 years. Mm. So oh, it's, it's, they should be deliberate, I, I think. Uh, I oh, mean, yeah. I, I would prefer them to, you know, say, "Hey, we, we've started work, and you know, you'll see it next year." That that's not going to happen. They want to underst- understand even where we are as a. How do the economics of this even work? Because the it, it sounds backwards, but the economics will di- dictate the story in some way. Right. You know, how big of a canvas are you making these things on? Uh, uh, are you going to do, you know, so it's, it's having a little bit of a think is not a terrible thing. And they've, we've had a little bit of a think before we had it, you know, between uh, Dalton's sec, you know, his last film and, and Pierce Brosnan's first. Yeah. Good and of course, most of the film studios were talking about, you know, say if, if Lucasfilm isn't successful, Solo was the first Star Wars film that didn't break even in the box office, but there are other franchises under the same kind of stable. Um, whereas for Eon, it's kind of just Bond. Exactly. Yeah, it's 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 a different. It's a it's a one character franchise. Mm. Uh, at least in at least in the movies. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm not sure if I would go and see a Felix movie. Maybe I would just to check it out. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> but the, yeah, I mean, the the hardcore Bond fans would readily. But is there an appetite for that beyond? Mm. You would have to work as a film without those. It would have to work as a film full stop as its own thing beyond any sort of beyond Bond connections. Yeah. And if if, if, if a Han Solo story uh, has troubles, would then, yes. Felix also is the, is the question. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm curious. So you've, I say, just to touch on your your writing history. So you've done books on, uh, well, the many men who've played James Bond, and on the Lost Adventures. I know quite a few people are interested in these Lost Timothy Dalton adventures. If you don't yeah. mind me asking, yeah, I've been asked before. So, a couple things. So, they were planning to make a third Timothy Dalton James Bond film. They had a script. Uh, they were even planning to make a, a fourth James, a Timothy Dalton James Bond film. And there was also a story for that. So for his, and the only reason it didn't happen is not because his second film didn't do as well as the box office. It, did, it didn't do great. I'm not suggesting that it was as successful as the other ones. 
But that's not why we didn't have a Timothy Dalton III. It was a problem with, you know, the rights and studio politics. And it was a big legal morass and Bond got swept up on it. Mm. Uh, and so everything got paused. But the big question about Timothy Dalton's third Bond was wh what kind of story would it be? Would it be sort of the light flippant Roger Moore, you know, at, you know, films, would it be more akin to License to Kill, Dalton's second very serious one? Would it take the best of both elements? Like, what was their approach? And there's two different versions of his third film. Uh, one is sort of what I would call a techno thriller. And then the other one is an action comedy. The, the 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 first version, which I would call a techno thriller, was co-written by Michael G. Wilson, mm. as well as Alphonse Ruggiero, who is who I interviewed in the book about working with Michael G. Wilson. He said he had a wonderful experience. They would take these walks together. They would make bread. He he said that Michael G. Wilson really treated him as an equal. Uh, even though Michael G. Wilson, you know, wrote a whole bunch of these Bond films and comes from, yeah. you know, the 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 Bond stock, you know. So <laughs> and he said that he so he was worried about that, but he said he 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 couldn't have he shouldn't have been because Wilson was really collaborative. But and the other thing I want to say about Alfonso Ruggiero, uh, I've been tracking him down for years. I mean, literally years to try to get in touch with him. And so when we scheduled a time to talk and the phone rang, you know, ring, 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 and he picked up, the first thing he said to me was, are you surprised I answered? <laughs> and the answer is, yeah, I'm totally surprised you answered because it hasn't been easy. But he, he was, it was so great to talk to him because he answered all my, all my questions. And he was a writer who wrote for Miami Vice. Mm. So people think that the third Dalton would have been really about drugs. Um, but that's not the case. He was hired not so much for his Miami Vice because he he also wrote for a show called uh, Wise Guys or Wise Guy, which was a early Sopranos esque show. It was serialized. Uh, it, it was character based, and it was it was really well acclaimed. So that had more to do with him being hired than the the Miami Vice connection. But because there's that Miami Vice connection, because Dalton's mm -hmm. second one was about drugs. People sort of mush the things together, but but mush they should not. They should remain. <laughs> they should remain separate. Um, and anyway, um, so the the Alfonso Guerrero's uh, version was they they came up with a seventeen page outline, uh, and they and he told me that there was even it even turned into a script. And one of the things that people remember about this is the idea of Bond versus robots. Mm -hmm. And I would like to put this in context. Okay. So there, it, it, the, the, the robot, the, excuse me, the villain uh, was all about cutting edge technology. So, you know, the, the, the villain had a smart car. There's a smart building essentially. Uh, and so to, to keep up with that, there was also this idea that there was a, an enhanced person, you know, think more $6 million man than, mm. than, than C-3PO. But you don't really know what this character is. Uh, you, they, they're Bond and this character who is silent and doesn't talk throughout the movie get in a fight and the, the character opens, you know, you, you, the, their insides are exposed and they're definitely enhanced in some way. But it's never really explained what the deal is and i think it was meant to be a little bit of a mystery mm -hmm. you know exactly what the deal is with this character um you know like in live and let die uh jeffrey holder's character gets killed yeah more than once and then you see him at the back of the train and you don't really know what happened yeah and and, and it's never explained and you don't care because it's mm -hmm. great so I, I think they were trying to, you know, suggest something, but without literally saying what happened. Yeah. So we've had magic in a Bond film, so why not technology? Yeah. Yeah. And 
and then then that version got completely rewritten. There there are certain elements of it that remain in the second version, the Davies and Osborne version, but it's but I consider them two separate works. Mm. The Davies and Osborne version is is an action comedy with a lot of big there was a big trope in the 80s, you know, I'm too old for this stuff. Yeah. You know, and that's what James Bond's through line through the story would have been was him starting out feeling like he's too old for this stuff mm. and suddenly you know over the course of the story realizing that he still has it and there's a there's a you know there's a scene of him you know disguising himself as a cowboy and going to a rodeo and and uh i i just love the thought of doll on and <laughs> that, that would work for me yeah and so I, there's an artist who I love, and and he drew he drew that for this book. He drew Dahl in a, in a cowboy hat, to, so uh, to give people a little taste of of what could have been. Um, and that film would have ended with you know Bond talking about his uh, his his run-ins with Goldfinger and Onjob. So they they would have connected Dalton's Bond more directly to to Connery's Bond. And then there was even a fourth Bond script for uh, um, rich, written by this guy named uh, Richard Smith. It's called Reunion with Death. And so I was trying to track him down. And Richard Smith, as you might imagine, is a very common name. Yes. yes. <laughs> and the variety, there's a, a, a Hollywood trade paper called Variety. And Variety misidentified him as like a makeup artist as an actor um uh so i i spent you have no idea how much time i spent looking for wrong richard smith and i finally tracked down the right richard smith and he had passed but his wife was kind enough to share with me his his excellent story and it feels more like you only live twice the novel Oh, it's it's there's something uh, elliptical about it. There's something you know, and it also draws on Moonraker, in that you you'd see uh, Bond's secretary, you'd mm. see a little bit of Bond's work life. The novel it was Moonraker, a fabulous story called uh, Reunion with Death. Yeah, very interesting, and that's really drawing on the novel Moonraker rather than the seventeen. Just the film. just the the only part that he took from Moonraker. Is the is sort of the work life the secretary uh, whose name I always mispronounce so you know Le- Leoli Ponsonby I always mispronounce it. it's not that um, I say it badly um, and so that's also great and I go into that in depth and then I'll, then the last thing about the the, the unmade Dalton mm. uh, is that there was also a possibility of a different first one. This would have been more like an, a James Bond origin story in which James Bond, a, a junior agent, is uh, paired up with a, a senior agent. And then over the course of that adventure, uh, Bond learns how to be a good double O agent. Oh, wow. So the first hint of an origin story for Bond. Yes, yes. And then it, it I, I like it, um, especially that stuff. Uh, but but Albert R. Broccoli felt that audience wanted to see Bond as a seasoned agent and not learning. And they sort of solved that issue in Casino Royale in that he's 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 100% capable mm. in Casino Royale. So you, you don't see him fumbling for his gun or making rookie mistakes, but he's a most... He's emotionally not James Bond. Yeah. So that was sort of an emotional origin story rather than him learning the ropes from a, a senior anybody. Okay. I'm afraid we're starting to hit against our time limit. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, go. 60 seconds. And I'm still very interested in all you have to say. Can I ask if we're all interested in what you have to say, where can we find you? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm on the interwebs, uh, <laughs> markedlets.com, uh, the, the 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 website the the app formerly known as Twitter, uh, I'm there as well. And uh, so, check out my books, The Lost Adventures of James Bond, 
movies go forth, and I've got something James Bond related coming out at the end of the year. Brilliant. So thank you. There will be links in the show notes. Thank you very, very much for being so generous with your time. I really appreciate it.